Um, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the third installment in Waterwatch's summer webinar series. Thank you all for tuning in. We're really excited to be here. I'm here with Dr. Peter Bruitt and our executive director, John DeVoe. Um, before we jump in, uh, we are going to have a Q&A after uh, Peter's presentation. Um, as with the last two webinars, if you would like to ask some questions, go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a Q&A box. You can type them in and then I will moderate the Q&A and ask the questions towards the end. Uh, if you're having any technical issues or having trouble connecting, um, feel free to shoot me an email throughout the presentation at neil at waterwatch.org. I'll put it right in the chat here for everybody. And um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to our executive director, John, to make some opening remarks here. Hey, thank you, Neil. Um, my name's John DeVoe. I'm the executive director of Waterwatch, and I've, I've been doing this for 17 years. Right before I started, I think the consent decree was signed uh, on in federal court on, on Savage Rapids Dam and the Rogue, and it, it required the Grants Pass Irrigation District and Water Watch and some others to go forth together to find the money and the authority to take Savage Rapids Dam out on the Rogue. We'll probably get to that a little bit tonight. Um, so I've been doing this for about 17 years, but the organization has a longer history doing it. Uh, we've been involved in dam removal since the beginning, um, and it's been an important part of our mission. And the organization's mission is to protect and restore stream flows for fish, wildlife, and people who depend on healthy rivers. We also remove obsolete dams, and we secure the balanced water policies Oregon and the West need to adapt to a changing climate. A little bit of background on our dam removal work, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Bruitt. Um, our Free the Rogue River campaign was one of the most significant river restoration campaigns in the nation, and it produced some results of national importance. It took many years, but there was a tipping point, and once the agreement to remove Savage Rapids Dam was finalized, uh, other things sort of fell in line and, and projects became much quicker in, in, in uh, execution. Within the span of a few weeks in the summer of 2008, the never completed Elk Creek Dam was notched, thanks to litigation stopping the project by Oregon Wild and action by multiple partners. And this freed an important rogue tributary where 30% of the rogue's coho salmon historically spawned. Right at the same time the Elk Creek Dam project was going on, the city of Gold Hill Dam which was on the main stem of the Rogue, which was originally a diversion dam for a bankrupt and long gone cement plant, was being removed from the Rogue. And I was actually lucky to be present when the Army Corps of Engineers began a series of explosions to notch the dam at Elk Creek. And these were the real deal. They were not like the photo op explosion that some of you may have seen at Marmot Dam on the Sandy. Uh, once it got the green light, the Corps did not mess around in uh, notching that dam without interference. So that was summer of 2008. In 2009, the campaign successfully completed the removal of, of the Rogue's biggest fish killer, Savage Rapids Dam. And this project was over two decades in the making. It began with Water Watch challenging an irrigation district's attempt to secure additional water diversions at the dam. And I believe at the time it was removed, it was the largest dam that had been removed in the American West. And Dr. Bruitt's book does a great job of documenting the long political struggle to remove this dam. A year later in 2010, contractors removed Gold Ray Dam, which was a defunct hydropower dam from the main stem of the Rogue River. Uh, at Gold Ray, there was no explosion, but there was an enterprising beaver working with an enterprising river and uh, they, those two succeeded in uh, releasing the river a few days in advance of the planned uh, date for letting the river run free. With the removal of Gold Ray, uh, the Free, free the Road campaign reestablished one of the longest free flowing reaches of river in the American West, 157 miles from the Lost Creek project upstream near Crater Lake to the Pacific Ocean. As a result of it migrating, salmon and steelhead have access, unimpeded access, to hundreds, several hundred miles of spawning and rearing habitat. Water temperatures in the Rogue were reduced uh, as a result of eliminating the reservoirs behind these dams. 
this temperature impact is significant for fish and will help the rogue adapt to the effects of the cl changing climate. Recreational economies have benefited with the removal of these dams. Um, and a tremendously important but often overlooked achievement is that at Sa when Savage Rapids Dam was removed, Water Watch completed one of the largest in-stream water right transfers in Oregon's history uh, at the dam. And outside of the protection secured for flows on the Yellowstone River, the protection secured on the Rogue uh, are, as far as I'm aware, the largest of their type in the West. This, this protection that we secured secure, it protects 800 cubic feet per second of water in stream on the Rogue for fish and future generations. This is about 18 billion gallons of water per year. Um, and due to the nature of development in the Rogue, you have you know, wilderness upstream, then development, and then downstream you have a lot of wilderness, which is different than the usual land use in a river basin. The protection of this water to the former Savage Rapids Dam site means that it's really de facto protected almost all the way to the Pacific. This is really important uh, and it's a very large and quantifiable result. After these main stem dams were removed, the action on the road turned to tributary streams. In 2014 and 15, Waterwatch removed Fielder and Weimer dams from Evans Creek. And at the time, this was the most significant fish passage barrier removal project in Oregon. Um, this project provided unimpeded access to about 70 miles of high quality habitat for fish. Today, biological surveys note the presence of lamprey and steelhead in areas where they had not previously been seen in the history of surveying in this subbasin. So that brings us up to today where we're working with many partners to remove other dams in Oregon. And we would like to think that on the Klamath, ultimately the biggest dam removal project of them all, we were correct all along. We were correct that the lower four dams could be removed without linking dam removal to a deal that sacrificed upper basin water, stream flows in the river, and water for national wildlife refuges. <clears throat> I think we analyzed those politics correctly. Although the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission threw a bit of a curveball recently on the removal of those four lower Klamath dams, we are optimistic the project will get done. And so stay tuned for news on that. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Bruett. Dr. Bruett is a tenured professor of environmental studies at Wofford College. He teaches and conducts research about environmental policy with an emphasis on the politics of river management and ecological restoration. In 2019, his book, Same River Twice, The Politics of Dam Removal and River Restoration, was published by the Oregon State University Press. He holds a PhD in environmental studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz and a BA in history from Dartmouth College. The book really breaks some new ground in an area that has not been covered much. It's a fascinating, well-written and very approachable book and I recommend it highly to you if you're interested in all of dam removal. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Peter Brewer. Thank you for being here, Doc. Thanks a lot, John. Um, so I'm Peter Bruett, and I'm from Wofford College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of my book um, here. Uh, Same River Twice is the story of three Northwestern dam removals and the politics and history that surround them. Um, but before I go into that, I want to talk a little bit about the big picture, about um, ecological restoration and how uh, I came to be doing this stuff. Um, so when I first learned about the environment, um, in grade school. Uh, the story that they told us was about loss and decline. Um, and I, I think this is how most of us learn about the environment at first. Uh, nature was beautiful and healthy and we ruined it. Uh, now this seemed terribly sad uh, to a nine-year-old, uh, and still does to a 39-year-old, um, but what's more, it, it seemed obvious and irreversible. Uh, everywhere I looked, uh, mother nature on the run, uh, more and more all the time. Uh, now, and to be fair, the, the story ha has a lot of truth to it. Um, look out your window, uh, or if you're on the East Coast and it's dark, um, imagine what's out your window. Um, what is out there and, and, and how natural is it? Um, what, what's out uh, your window, I can almost guarantee, um, is an altered landscape. Uh, we, we've paved forests and filled wetlands and turned prairies into soybeans. Um, and even if uh, you're fortunate enough to live in a relatively wild area, 
it's unlikely that your swamps or mountains have all the animals that they used to. Uh, people have remade the world and made it uh, what we want it to be. Uh, but it doesn't have to be like this and it doesn't have to stay like this. Um, at about that same age, eight or nine, um, I think that our teacher read the Lorax to us. Uh, and I don't know if everyone's familiar with Dr. Seuss's masterpiece, but um, the Lorax ends with the hope that if you take care, then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. Um, now, as I got older, um, I found that that was true too. Uh, not the Lorax specifically, but uh, that nature could come back. Uh, the house that I grew up in in New Hampshire is surrounded by forests where moose and bears live. Uh, and a hun hundred years ago though, I, and I've seen the photographs, it was bare fields. That's ecological restoration. The idea that nature can come back. Um, but restoration, like degradation, is a human process. Um, people have to decide that they want to live and work in a restored environment. And so I decided um, early on you know, in graduate school that I wanted to try to figure out how people decide to restore ecosystems. And I quickly learned that there's nothing more restorative than removing a dam. Uh, at first, I, I was shocked to hear that people were taking out dams at all. I, I didn't think that that happened. Um, but over the last 20 years or so, as I now know, about 1,300 dams have been removed from the rivers of the United States. Uh, now before we go too far into dams, it's important to bear in mind um, dams can be important tools. I don't want to pretend otherwise. Um, there's a thread in the environmental movement that sees dams as the work of the devil. Uh, literally, John McPhee in uh, Encounters the Arch Druid, a terrific book that uh, probably a lot of the people listening have read, uh, puts them at the center of hell. Um, but uh, when you get down to it, uh, I think we have to be clear that, that dams are tools, uh, machines. They're built by people, well-meaning people, um, reasonable people to irrigate crops or spin turbines or hold on to drinking water. Um, so that's, that's what dams are, that's what they do. But while they do all this, dams are landscape changers. Uh, and to talk a little bit about just how they change the landscape and how much, uh, I'm gonna share a little bit from the chapter of my first book, um, the first chapter of my book here. So the, the legacy of the New Deal and the go-go years is not just about big dams like Hoover and Glen Canyon. Uh, it is more subtle than that. Uh, there are fewer than 1,000 hundred-foot dams in America. Uh, while America had its eyes on big dams and big rivers, tens of thousands of smaller ones were rising in brooks and creeks and kills and runs all over the country. By the 1990s, the National Research Council estimated that two and a half million dams, that averages out to 50,000 dams per state, stood in America's waterways. But this is only an educated guess. Most dams are not recorded anywhere. And while a little three-foot dam in some nameless tributary uh, isn't a landscape changer or economic engine like Hoover or Grand Coulee, it still holds up sentiment, and widens and slows the river, and bars the movement of a wide variety of animals. <clears throat> Now, fast forward to 2018, when I wrote this, um, and they're all falling apart. An estimated 85% of American dams are past their useful lives as of this year. Many of these structures were built for purposes that no longer exist. But although regional economies have moved on, the dams still sit in their rivers, decaying year after year. The US Army Corps of Engineers, which keeps an inventory of America's 87,000-ish dams, rated at over 27,000 of them as having high or significant hazard potential. That's just the major dams, not, um, not all two and a half million. A productive dam that halts floods and makes electricity and diverts irrigation water can be a valuable tool, but most American dams aren't like that. On a subtler, but just as politically important level, the go-go years made us a nation of lakes, uh, but they aren't really lakes. Uh, referring to a dam's impoundment as a lake is a cultural distinction. In some countries, a lake is only a natural lake. Many states have no natural lakes. There aren't many forces of nature that dig out basins and fill them with water. The lakes and levees, the beloved of characters in country songs, were mostly engineered in the middle of the 20th century. But even if a dam was originally built to produce power or hold drinking water, plays some other economically productive role, its impoundment quickly becomes a recreational center for the community and a beloved quasi-natural feature. 
the most common primary purpose for a structure on the national inventory of dams is recreation. We build our heritage quick in America. Now, all this aside, dams are a Pandora's box of ecological destruction. That dams change their landscape is obvious to anyone who looks. They flood the valley above them and turn floodplains and forests into an artificial lake. Often, these lakes host an array of invasive species that thrive in still waters. Dams sequester flows of silt, gravel, and woody debris, the raw material of river habitat. Downstream, this leaves an armored riverbed made of only large immovable stones and a narrower, deeper channel. Sandbars and estuaries and beaches, even if they're many miles downstream, dwindle as their sand and silt washes away without being replenished. Sometimes all of this is considered to be a trade-off for climate-friendly power. The alternative to a dam might be a coal-fired power plant and all its carbon. But this is not necessarily the case. Plants rotting in the reservoir and releasing methane, among other processes, make some dams significant greenhouse gas producers. Just as silt is stuck above the dam, fish, unless they're spry enough to leap over it or to climb a fish ladder, are stuck below it. This is especially bad for migratory species like salmon that must move upstream to spawn. There are many accounts of fish leaping crash into dams and spillways <clears throat> in vain attempts to reach upstream spawning sites. Some dams have fish ladders or other passage mechanisms built in, but overall, these are not very effective, especially for species that cannot jump. Dams disproportionately bar fish from certain types of habitat, upland forest with lots of melting snow and downstream floodplains, for instance. As this happens, the salmon runs that rely on this headed habitat suffer. This is a problem not just for the fish or even the river, but for entire upstream ecosystems. Under natural conditions, flesh from salmon carcasses, most of them die after they spawn, spreads far beyond the water's edge, nourishing many other animals and even plants throughout the upstream parts of the basin. Only about six or seven percent of all the millions of pounds of nutrients that salmon once brought up from the sea make it inland today. Even small dams tire or delay fish as they strive to leap over them or school at the base of fish ladders. Stuck at the dam site, the fish are in grave danger from predators, from mergansers to bears, a near literal example of fish in a barrel. For the fish that hatch upstream, migration down to the ocean through or over the dam is possible but dangerous. Agricultural diversions sometimes channel fish into canals and deposit them on farmers' fields. Hydroelectric turbines can chew up fish as they pass downstream and nitrogen dissolving under the pressure of spillways can give fish gas bubble disease. This is what we call the bends in human scuba divers. The water below a dam may also be artificially warm or cold depending on how water is released from the reservoir. Along with the physical stress of high temperatures, cold water fish must survive the diseases and parasites that thrive in warm water. So, <clears throat> got all these dams sitting in rivers, a lot of them not doing much for anybody. Why are they still there? Well, there are a lot of reasons, of course, um, but the problem overall is that when dams change landscapes, they change communities as well. <clears throat> they give people a lake to swim in and look at and create a new normal for anglers, especially if they're stocked with a desirable uh, fishing species. Um, they even change the groundwater. All of this in addition to whatever their money-making function might be. People get used to their dam landscape and people like what they're used to. But beyond this, their everyday uses, um, dams have been a mission. I mentioned the New Deal and the go-go years, which is what author Mark Reisner calls the 50s and 60s when a lot of our dams were built. Um, now for most of American history, people built dams not just for their functions, but out of a deep belief that rivers needed dams and that every drop of water going into the ocean was a waste, and that we needed to control and harness and tame nature. Uh, especially in the West, dams were civilization. People didn't just like dams and use dams, they believed in dams, and many people still believe in dams. All of this means that the problem for dam removal isn't ecology or engineering or even economics, it's politics. Dams and their reservoirs shape people's values, their experiences, their familiar landscapes, and those are the kinds of things that are hard to negotiate. You, all of you listening to this, probably have a familiar lake or a pond that's held in by a dam. Uh, you might not even know it. Uh, half a mile from where I'm sitting right now, there's a little lake that my wife's known all her life. Uh, but it wasn't until I was writing this book that I pointed out the dam that makes the lake. Uh, now, the dam that introduced me to Water Watch, um, I suppose the reason that I'm here now, was 
a 39 foot irrigation structure in the Rogue River of Southern Oregon, Savage Rapids Dam, owned and operated by the Grants Pass Irrigation District. Um, to share a little bit of its story and give you a sense of how and why its removal mattered, uh, here's another section from my book. <clears throat> Savage Rapids was an obstinate dam. It was first condemned in 1994 when the Grants Pass Irrigation District, which owned the dam, agreed to remove it, but it was saved. Again, in 1997, GPID de decided to remove its dam. And again, it was saved. Finally, in 2001, the Irrigation District once more promised to remove Savage Rapids Dam. This time, there was no reprieve, but it was only in 2009, after decades of acrimony and toil, that Savage Rapids actually fell. The removal of Savage Rapids Dam destroyed no jobs, bankrupted no businesses, released no toxins. The dam's function, to divert the waters of the Rogue River into GPID's canals, continued as before. The district, using pumps, delivered the same amount of water to its patrons. But hundreds of people fought furiously for years, risking their bank accounts, their reputations, even their friendships in the process. Their motivation, not easily defined or quantified, was simple. People loved the dam. The Rogue Valley. The Rogue River rises in Crater Lake National Park, flows west out of the Cascades, 215 miles, and empties into the Pacific Ocean, just north of the California border. Most of its 5,000 square mile watershed is quite wild, with <clears throat> mountains in the upper reaches and temperate rainforest near the mouth. The Rogue was one of the eight original rivers to gain wild and scenic status in 1968. It hosts some of Oregon's largest populations of salmon, anadromous salmon and trout. Most of the people in the Rogue Valley live in the middle reaches of the river where Interstate 5 runs through the cities of Grants Pass, Medford, and Ashland. This little stretch of Southern Oregon, far from the state's power centers in Portland and Salem, enjoys its own distinct landscape and identity. The Rogue Valley of a century ago was thirsty for water. An editorial in the Grants Pass Daily Courier titled Water Everywhere compared the people of the valley to Coleridge's ancient mariner distressed that the rogue's water ran along useless into the sea. In 1916, the farmers of Grants Pass formed an irrigation district covered, covering 18,000 acres of dusty Southern Oregon. By 1921, the district had raised enough money to build a diversion dam at Savage Rapids. The dam was raised higher in each summer's irrigation season in order to lift the level of the reservoir and allow water to flow into irrigation canals. This process formed a lake that would become a popular recreation spot. Grants Pass greeted the construction of Savage Rapids Dam with great fanfare. In the Daily Courier, many articles boosted the irrigation project, and the paper covered the dam's construction avidly. A crowd of 3,000 turned out to watch the dedication ceremony, and in 1922, the irrigation district printed Christmas cards displaying their new dam. People in remote southern Oregon, only a generation removed from the homestead days, doubtless sent these cards back east with a certain pride to show that now they too lived in a modern community, and that they and their crops would no longer live and die at the whim of the weather. In 1929, the state of Oregon awarded GPID a water right, allowing it to divert 230 <clears throat> cubic feet per second of the Rogue River, an allotment of 1 80th of a cubic foot per second per acre. All of this spelled disaster for the Rogue salmon and steelhead trout. The dam diverted juvenile fish into irrigation canals from which they were pumped up and spilled out across the land. One farmer spoke of scooping hundreds of salmon fry out of his field and local children would find little fish on the ground after irrigation. Downstream migrants that escaped the canals churned through the dam's turbines and were turned into fish salad. Savage Rapids fish ladder delayed adult fish's migration upstream, keeping them waiting at the base of the dam. For anglers and other more natural predators, it was like fishing in an aquarium. The dam also heated the river downstream, releasing sun-warmed water from the still surface of Savage Rapids Lake. This increased physical stress on the migrating salmon, which are cold water fish. In 1934, a new fish ladder was built on the dam's south side, but in 1941, investigation from the Oregon Game Commission still found 14 to 38% mortality at the dam. By 1949, the cost of fish passage was onerous enough, GPID asked the Bureau of Reclamation to help repair its dam, incurring a debt it would carry into the 2000s. In the 70s, BOR Reclamation put together a report on renovations that would fix fish passage, but there were no acceptable bids, so the issue was dropped. Major repairs and fish passage problems continued through the 20th century. 
1982, for example, <clears throat> 1,500 adult steelhead trout were trapped because of malfunctioning ladders, prompting a rescue operation by GPID and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. In the mid-60s, ODF and W biologists had rated Savage Rapids Dam the biggest fish passage problem on the entire Rogue River. The label fish killer would stick to the dam for the rest of existence, its existence and beyond, though it was also sometimes known as the smolt pulverizer. There had always been conflicts between fish and dams in southern Oregon. Historically, the Rogue had hosted immense runs of salmon and steelhead trout, enough to sustain a cannery near the river mouth and a sport fishing economy upstream. In the 1930s, fishing on the Rogue was good enough to attract famous anglers like movie star Clark Gable and Western novelist Zane Gray, men who presumably could have chosen to fish anywhere they wanted. Zane Gray had a cabin on the Rogue and set one of his novels there, Rogue River Feud. But the many users claiming the Rogue upstream, downstream, and otherwise put the river's fish and its fishermen under pressure. Rogue River Feud, in fact, is about conflicts between canneries and upstream fishers. As early as 1910, a group called the Rogue River Fish Protection Association formed to help defend the Rogue's fisheries. In 1916, fishermen were suspected of blowing up a small structure called the Ament Dam in order to restore fish passage. Whether they actually did it or not, it didn't make much difference for the fish. Through the 20th century, the Rogue's fish population plummeted, like many throughout the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> Commercial fishing had ended by 1935, and a disgusted Zane Gray moved north to find better fishing on the Albuquerque River. Explaining the decline of a salmon run is rarely simple. Changing land uses throughout the rogue watershed and fluctuating ocean conditions undoubtedly played their parts in the fisheries decline, but so did dams. In the 1970s, the Coal River's hatchery was built upstream of Grants Pass and rogue salmon runs were artificially augmented with hatchery stock. This put more fish in the river, but at some ecological cost. Through the 20th century, fishing groups worked with GPID to restore fish passage and habitat around Savage Rapids and Grants Pass. For example, the rogue fly fishers and the local chapter Northwest Steelheaders pitched in to help rebuild the fish ladders in the 1980s, but such efforts came nowhere near perfecting fish passage at the dam. All the while, Grants Pass and the Irrigation District were changing. The Rogue Valley of 1921 had been an agricultural place, but over time, GPID's community of patrons became more and more urban and suburban. The Middle Rogue is an island of aridity in Western Oregon. The Grants Pass town slogan is, it's the climate. I have a footnote there that notes that walking around Grants Pass on a 100 degree day makes a little bit of a mockery of it's the climate, but the rest of the year is very pleasant. And the dry, temperate conditions, more like California than Portland, began to lure retirees to Southern Oregon. These same conditions had made irrigation and the dam necessary in the 1920s, but 60 years later, very few GPID patrons were actually farmers. This sort of social shift is an ongoing trend across the rural West. GPID patrons subdivided and sold their land. By 2012, the irrigation district's average parcel size was about one acre. Many of these small scale landowners did not actually get irrigation water. GPID is not responsible for getting the water up to its patrons' lawns or fields, and a retiree may not care to buy and operate their own pumping system. This unusual situation is sometimes compared to a school district where landowners' taxes support the local school whether they have children there or not. As early as 1980, GPID board chair Paul Brandon told Oregon Water Resources Department Administrator Larry Jabusik that the board believed GPID was no longer a viable irrigation district and discussed converting it to some other body more appropriate for the new Grants Pass. The dam was aging and despite continual maintenance efforts, removal had been discussed as early as 1975. And the dam was already political. The fishing groups that had helped GPID with upgrades criticized changes that might hurt the fish, including the potential installation of hydroelectricity in the mid 80s. All of this left a policy paradox. The Rogue River and Savage Rapids Dam were different things to different people. To some, this was a mostly wild river that provided fish with a dam that was somewhere between an imperfection and a problem. To others, the Rogue was a reservoir of irrigation water that also allowed them to swim and water ski, and the dam was a tool to hold on to it. These two identities and the management approaches they demanded were, of course, in direct conflict. As salmon runs dwindled, farms became subdivisions, the dam aged, and the environmental movement rose on the horizon. Contrary demands and ideologies collided. Now, I don't want to go into the intricacies of the whole Savage Rapid story here and now uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is I don't want to spoil the drama for when all of you read my book. But the big reason is that Savage Rapids is, of course, its own story, and the dams that matter most to anyone who's listening right now are your own dams. So I'm going to share some observations uh, gained from Savage Rapids and from my studies of other dams um, that 
<clears throat> um, probably apply in your own local rivers and lakes and dams. In any environmental problem, different people look at the same situation and see it through different frames. Uh, a dam can be a tool of progress and prosperity or a river killing blight. A forest wilderness can be a magnificent landscape or a waste of timber. A wolf can be a dangerous pest or a beautiful and necessary part of an ecosystem. I have my own perspective and you definitely do too. Uh, but regardless of how we think, when a controversy rises or a decision has to be made, all perspectives become politically important. In restoration, especially, whatever happened to degrade the ecosystem, uh, whatever the problem that a restorationist is trying to undo, probably happened because somebody believed in it. And those beliefs are still there. American history is short. When, when Savage Rapids was proposed for removal in the 1980s, there were people in Grant's past that remembered, as children, the excitement as it was built. And they thought, why would anyone want to take out their dam? Uh, river politics are particularly complicated. Uh, everyone uses the river. Uh, whether they're irrigators or kayakers or they rely on groundwater for their wells or they just love taking their kids to splash on the banks. Um, so as dams shape rivers, dam politics become everybody's business and everybody gets involved and everybody has feelings about it. This makes for a lively political situation. American politics is very open and anyone who cares has a lot of different places to access power. Um, you can sue, you can lobby your politicians from local to the president, you can donate to pressure groups, you can found your own group, you can pass around petitions, you can write letters to the editor, you can share irresponsibly sourced quotes on Facebook, you can run for office. Uh, and people on Savage Rapids did all of these, um, except for the Facebook part because it hadn't been invented yet. Um, but what all this means is that if you have the energy and the resources, you can always find a new way to keep fighting about your dam. In political science, we call this venue shopping. Um, dams and rivers offer a ton of different political venues. All this means that it is relatively easy to stop a dam from being removed, especially if it's an expensive project that needs external funding. Funders, especially um, go the government, um, aren't likely to give out money until everything's been resolved. So in a dam controversy, uh, it's necessary a lot of the time to weld together all the different voices and interests into one coalition uh, try to make everyone as whole as possible and move forward together, not just to remove a dam, but to manage the river. Now, all the stuff that we've been talking about here, environmental politics, ecological restoration, dam removal, um, are really about the future, about what we want our rivers to be. Um, so I want to go in here with a few uh, predictions and recommendations of my own. Uh, uh, first off, we're, we're seeing rivers being managed uh, a little bit more as watersheds and a little bit less as kind of grab bags of issues and jurisdictions, uh, which I, I would say was the, the model a few decades ago. Um, we're seeing watershed councils organized all over the country. Um, some of them have more clout than others, but uh, they all at the least let different users and interests talk to each other and share information and build familiarity and trust and even friendship between people who see and use the river in different, different ways. Watershed councils, um, are not a, a cure-all drug for river problems. Uh, not everything is subject to compromise. The councils don't usually have a lot of money or power, uh, but they can be really useful all the same. Um, this trend should and is likely to continue. Uh, and I urge all of you listening to this uh, to see if there's any kind of a watershed organization for your own river and to check out what it does and who's involved. <clears throat> Once we start looking at watersheds as watersheds, one of the things that we're probably going to find is a whole lot of little dams. Uh, most dams aren't anywhere near as big as Savage Rapids, let alone something like Hoover. Um, and in aggregate though, uh, a whole bunch of five foot dams scattered around different tributaries uh, can do as much ecological damage as one big dam. But these little dams are probably a lot easier to remove and cheaper and less likely to be important to the community or to the economy. In most watersheds, Small dams and defunct dams uh, should be the target for restorations. Um, in the rogue watershed, um, and John mentioned this earlier, uh, while Savage Rapids and a couple of the other bigger removals um, got a lot of attention, uh, a whole cluster of little dams came out over the last 20 years uh, without too much fighting from anyone. Uh, not no fighting, that's too much to hope for. But when, after the dam comes out, the question that arises is, does it work? Now, the evidence so far is that dam removal works pretty well. Now, one of the other stories 
in my book is about the Elwha removal in Washington's Olympic Peninsula. Now, this was the biggest dam removal project ever so far. Um, they took out two dams. One of them was uh, 210 feet tall. Uh, most of the Elwha is in Olympic National Park. Uh, so this was as close to a lab style controlled experiment and restoration as we could hope for. Um, most watersheds are uh, more messier, more complicated than the Elwha. But in this, in this case, the dams were almost the only significant development in the watershed. Uh, the politics, uh, just a note, were just as intense and complicated as with Savage Rapids and all the political stuff that I've said so far um, applies to the Elwha as well. Um, the second uh, and final dam and the Elwha removal came out in 2014. After removal, scientists from the lower Elwha Clallam tribe and from federal agencies have found salmon swimming where they hadn't been in almost 100 years uh, and reforestation in the lake sites and an expanding estuary at the mouth of the river. Um, lots of the responses that you would expect and, and hope for in the landscape. Um, but they've also found some surprises and learned lessons that will surely apply to other rivers in the future. Uh, this, uh, you would think, is how the science of restoration and dam removal should go. Do something, learn from it, record what's happening, and so on. But a lot of the time, nobody checks. Nobody looks at what's happened to the river after dam removal or whether the dam removal has, in fact, worked. Um, how are the fish populations changing above or below the dam? How has the silt moved after removal? Um, what grows in after the lake has drained? Um, these would be valuable to know all these things, um, but they take long-term attention and funding. And in a lot of cases that are not as high profile as the Elwha, um, that kind of attention, that kind of funding uh, doesn't happen. Uh, in, in some of the other smaller removals that have taken place on the West Coast, I, I found that people who are in charge of the river uh, in say 2012, uh, didn't even know that a dam had been removed in oh, 2004. Um, dam removals and rivers in general, and really ecology in general, needs more monitoring. Even simple basic monitoring should could become a standard part of watershed management to allow us to see what works, what doesn't work, um, and how. Um, the biggest political problem with dams though is that they are immortal. There are very few ways to determine when a dam's useful life is actually over and what to do when that happens. Um, and this really doesn't make sense. Um, you are not allowed to leave your old car to rust in the middle of the highway, but you can absolutely leave your old dam to crumble in the middle of the public waterway. Uh, the, the, the dam equivalent of Studebakers and Pontiacs sit there in rivers all over America. Um, it would be in the public interest to make policy based on the licensing that we have in place for hydropower dams um, and review old dams. You could even have this focus just on the larger dams that are on the Army Corps' inventory. Um, you could start with 100-year-old dams where there are a manageable 4,000 of them-ish. Um, and then figure out if, if these dams are useful, then great, let's make sure that they are safe and well-maintained and they comply with environmental laws. Um, but if they're not, if they're not useful, then it should take them out. Um, and if they're not useful economically, but they're beloved locally, um, then it would make sense to pass ownership and responsibility to the town or the county, unless um, the landowner is eager to maintain it. Um, uh, dam removal, here in 2020 is becoming more and more normal. Um, in the 80s, when Savage Rapids and Elwha first got going as political issues, uh, people were aghast that you would think about doing this. How you couldn't believe um, that the dam removal might be uh, an idea even. <clears throat> um, now, uh, it's happening all the time. Uh, more and more normal with each year that goes by. Um, if we formalized it, it would make it a routine part of the cycle of America's rivers. And I think that rivers and their communities will be healthier for it. Um, so I'm very thankful for everyone's time and I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody has now. So um, thank you so much, Peter. That was that was wonderful. Um, I have a couple of questions lined up here, but before we jump into Q and A, I want to invite uh, Bob Hunter, 
who I believe is on this call, but we may have lost him here. I don't see him in the chat. Bob, if you're on this call, uh, shoot me a quick email and I'll get you on the panel here, but we'll go ahead and start fielding some questions. Um, the first question I had was early on, and this was a question from Susan, and she was asking, uh, is removal of the four Snake River dams essential to preserve the resident orcas of Puget Sound? And if so, uh, do we know what is being done to assure that that happens? Um, well, big caveat that I haven't focused research on the snake, but of course, working in the Northwest on dam stuff, you hear a lot about it. Um, all I would say is that while it seems that uh, the orcas of Puget Sound uh, could really use more salmon making their way in and out of uh, the rivers in that area, um, one, uh, the snake eventually empties out into the Columbia, so I'm not, I don't know how much interaction there is between the salmon that spawn there and the salmon that make their way into Puget Sound itself. Um, but even if there was a connection there, um, it would take uh, several generations for the um, improved habitat to result in more salmon making their way back into um, rivers as adults. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think the, the connection between Snake River Dam removal and orcas in Puget Sound specifically might be a, a little attenuated. Does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Thank you, Peter. Um, I just want to pause for a moment. We got Bob online. Uh, I just want to introduce uh, Water Watch board member and longtime conservationist Bob Hunter. Um, he played an integral role in the uh, Rogue River and Savage Rapid Dam removals and is here to answer some questions that, that might relate to that. Um, thanks so much for being here, Bob. Uh, you're welcome. It's great to be here. And I just do want to just say briefly, uh, I read Peter's book and uh, it's really a, a very uh, fun read, very interesting, and anybody interested in uh, dam removals and knowing and learning more about the inside and how difficult and political some of these were, uh, he really gives some uh, nice insights and uh, uh, one of the few places you can go and kind of really learn all the stuff that went on. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Um, I have a question from John Hamilton. He's raised his hand, so I'm going to give him uh, the microphone here and let him ask it. Given him a request to unmute. Um, we'll keep moving until, uh, until we hear John here, but um, okay. oh, there we go. I'm with the program now. Okay. <laughs> no worries. I got on here late. I'm sorry, Dr. Brewitt. Um, but how often um, does misinformation uh, enter into the, um, the, the public's understanding of a dam removal project? So often. Um, <clears throat> I, just to, uh, to give, take a quick tangent off of that, one of the things that uh, researching dam removal politics taught me is how common conspiracy theories are, and I now teach a class on it. Um, Everybody has their own idea of the dam, as I, as I uh, mentioned, um, but that leads to people having really optimistic senses of um, what, of, of why they're right, basically. Um, that people will come up with very convoluted explanations of why they could have their cake and eat it too, so to speak. Um, why you can keep the dam, but then still restore the salmon. Um, why dam removal will poison everyone um, on the on the rogue one of my, one of my first weeks doing research there i was in the josephine county historical society library and a guy came in and started talking about particles in the silt that that were poisonous and I, i'm not a geologist and he sounded like he knew what he was talking about and so i listened to one i was like, oh wow yeah this is gonna be something i'm really gonna have to get into and i found it, he, he didn't know anything there was nothing they they did studies on the rogue sentiment and it was fine. But this guy had gotten the idea in his head that this was happening and went around telling people, and if you didn't know or you didn't want, or you're too busy to do research, you'd believe it. Um, that kind of thing happens a lot. Um, and it's one of the main barriers, I would say, um, to unified, sensible progress on, not well, dam removal, but on all kinds of issues. So how do you, 
how do you counter that? Um, it's it's pretty difficult. I I would say that uh, you have to. That's one of the things that that, that um, watershed councils and similar groups can be useful in is kind of get get it, getting everybody the same information and getting different groups on the same page so that you can hear from whoever knows best about you know whatever the issue is because it almost always comes down to some sort of a technical um, matter that you need to hear from experts about. Um, ultimately, if there's someone who's a, a real conspiracy theorist and um, won't uh, won't change their ideas when they get, get new information, um, then eventually you can probably marginalize that person because um, there, there, there's a lot of them, but there's not quite so many as to destroy any chance at, at a good resolution. Um, but yeah, uh, I guess just doing your best and trying to meet them where they are uh, is the only thing I could suggest. If, if I could go back on the... Uh the Orca Snake River connection. Uh, Wendy McDermott from American Rivers is watching and she's pointed out that science has pretty much made a huge connection between the ability of all these salmon uh, in the snake to nourish the orca population um, in the Puget Sound because a lot of the Columbia salmon do turn right and go north. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so yeah, there is a, there's quite a connection there uh, and those orcas are starving and unable to uh, raise their young at this point. It's not solely Snake River salmon, but uh, I think it's there's a huge contributing factor there. Um, and I think that I think that's acknowledged in the uh, environmental impact work that just came out from the federal government in the last 10 days or so. Um, another person asked a question about the connection between uh, well, what happened at FERC recently on the Klamath dams? And I'll, Bob or I could, Bob, why don't you want to take a crack at that? Um, yeah, basically the uh, dam removal deal that was structured on the Klamath with the dam's owner, Pacificor, uh, one of the main elements for Pacificor was basically to at some point be off the license and turn it over to the dam removal entity so it would be free from any liability that might arise from removal. And uh, so the uh, Pacific Corps and uh, Clamps Restoration Council is the dam removal entity uh, went to FERC to get approval of the transfer of the license to the dam removal entity. Uh, but FERC uh, refused to actually do a complete transfer, uh, allow the transfer to the dam removal uh, entity, but only uh, on the condition that uh, Pacific Corps remained a co-licensee. And what that meant for Pacific Corps is they then would have more potential liability uh, when dam removal go forward. So essentially they have a right to back out of the deal because the deal isn't what they made. So that's where it stands right now. And, and groups are really hoping that uh, it's still a great deal for Pacific Corps, share, Pacific Corps and its shareholders and its customers that they'll still uh, complete the deal with that uh, twist to it. Uh, so thank, thanks, John, and thanks, Bob. Um, I have uh, one question that was emailed me to, to me earlier today that I'd like to share from Ron. Um, this is for Dr. Bruitt, and he's asking, again, on the, the Snake River dams, what your thoughts are on the possibility of the removal of those four dams between Lewiston, Idaho, and the Tri-Cities, Washington? Well, uh, again, this isn't something that I focus my research on, so I can only speak as a... Uh, Somebody knows a lot about dams in the Northwest, but not a lot about those specific ones. Um, my impression is that they, <clears throat> um, they would potentially restore a lot of habitat in the Columbia watershed. Um, but uh, one observation that I did pick up during the course of my research is that they've become a real kind of political football, uh, more, than, more than almost any other dam that I can think of. Um, even when the Elwha deal was being struck in the late 90s, um, Senator Slade Gorton uh, tried to work in uh, assurances that if the Elwog dams came out, then they, they would guarantee the safety of the snake dams. Um, so that makes it politically pretty tough. Um, I, yeah, it, it, it's, it seemed, my, my general suggestion would be to try to focus on dams that 
uh, could could come out more readily and kind of more maybe build up more momentum. And but I can't comment on the specifics of you know in terms of cost or sedimentation or habitat or that kind of thing about the snake. All right. Um, next up is a question from Monica. Uh, she's been working on an internship project addressing challenges and measuring salmon recovery. And she's come to the conclusion that the recovery equation needs a human metric or some way to measure the human connection to the project and to the environment. So her question to Dr. Brewitt is, uh, with your experience studying the human factor in politics around dam removal, what would you recommend as a metric to be included in gauging success of a restoration project? Well, um, this is actually something I'm working on right now. Uh, not in terms of putting together a metric, but um, in terms of measuring success. And um, I, I think it would be really difficult to, usually when we talk about a metric, I assume you mean kind of a, a, a number, a way, to, a way to express that quantitatively. Um, I, I don't see a, a real durable way to, to put together a number, but I do think that it uh, would be very valuable to, well, first of all, to engage whatever the affected community is throughout the restoration process, but then especially after, um, see how, whether it's been successful or not from their perspective. Um, are, are they glad that the project has happened? Are they using the new space uh, and so on? Um, and then be able to learn from that. And then in the next project, take those human lessons and be more effective um, politically um, from the get-go. Um, so, yeah, you, I mean, you, you could do any number of surveys or focus groups or interviews and, and get uh, a pretty good qualitative um, expression of how much satisfaction people had and what they thought. Um, I'm not sure if it would rise to a kind of widely usable metric. Does that make sense? I hope. Monica? It makes sense to me. <laughs> um, thanks, Peter. Uh, so uh, this, this next question is for the panel um, at large, whoever wants to jump in here. This is a question from David. Um, and he's asking, he, he mentions that beavers provide a huge value to watersheds and is wondering if smaller, better constructed dams could provide a similar benefit to the benefit that beavers provide. I'll, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, there's been a long discussion over the last few sessions in the Oregon legislature about artificial beaver dams or beaver dam analogs. And part of this has resulted from uh, the Sylvie's Ranch installing like hundreds of these things without any permits initially out in uh, Eastern Oregon. Um, the answer is it depends. And, you know, I think the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, the Fish and Wildlife Commission at its last meeting dealt with a proposal to uh, eliminate the trapping of beaver on federal lands in Oregon, and it voted not to, to prohibit that trapping. Um, there are many issues with these artificial beaver dams or these beaver dam analogs, one of which is fish passage. Another is what about water that's stored behind these structures? Do people have to get a water right for that? Is it depriving other people who have senior water rights of their water? And in the places where they've been built in Eastern Oregon, those are live issues. Um, so there will be a legislative proposal around this in the next legislative session, I'm pretty sure. Um, if you're interested in the issue, you should contact Brian Posowitz at Waterwatch. He's worked deeply on this issue for more than a couple sessions and he knows it in and out. Uh, but, but the bottom line is in some of these incised uh, river or stream beds out on, on the east side, beavers would be a great thing to have. Um, sometimes I wanna ask the question, well, why don't we just restore the beaver if we want the benefits from what they do on the landscape. And uh, I think we've been kind of slow to do that and, and quicker to try and uh, create dams that mimic or attempt to mimic the benefits they provide. But those benefits come with a lot of, of challenges as well. So contact Brian Pazza, which is at Waterwatch. He can, he'd be happy to spend time with you on the telephone and 
answer any questions you have about it. Thanks, John. Uh, Dr. Britt? There, uh, so I've, I've learned to use Zoom in this year, 2020, like all of us, and I just use the hand raise feature. Um, there's a, there is a movement to um, restore beavers, um, and not in the West and not just in the West, uh, because they, they, once you have them on the landscape, provide these benefits pretty much for free and don't file for a water right or anything. Um, <clears throat> Uh, th at the same time, it is tough to have them in a place that's a more human landscape where it might be difficult, you know, in a neighborhood to have beavers. Um, but overall, I would say that uh, encouraging beaver restoration in landscapes that are big enough to have them without too much human conflict um, seems like a bit of a growing thing. There's a film, actually, I'm going to boost by um, a filmmaker named Sarah Konigsberg called The Beaver Believers, which is about this movement. Um, if anybody takes an interest, I'm sure that Google will take you to The Beaver Believers and learn more about it. Great, thank you. Um, the next question uh, is for Dr. Bruett, and um, Tim writes that you mentioned biomonitoring is key to understanding our successes or failures of dam removal. But often the cost, after the cost of removal, it seems that no one has the money or the interest to conduct a good biomonitoring program. So his question is, do you have suggestions on how we can overcome this problem and make biomonitoring more appealing or maybe make folks understand how necessary it is? Hmm. Um, that's, that's sensible. Um, first, it's, I mean, there's just not going to be that many dollars to do real intensive uh, monitoring by well-trained professionals all the time, except on you know, in very specific cases. Um, but I would say that um, doing seasonal or annual surveys and doing them of the kind of thing that a well-trained amateur uh, can do w would be a lot better than nothing, especially over the course of some years. Um, you could combine this with Oh, something as simple as taking the same photograph each time every every three months and, and then recording how the landscape changes over the course of that time. Um, the uh, anal analogy to this, I think, would be Christmas bird counts, where most of the people who go birding um, like birds but are not ornithologists. Um, but overall, it gives us a sense of the fluctuation of populations across the country. Um, I think that if you had um, monitoring that was accessible to people like that or potentially to schools and um, made it regular and predictable, then in a lot of places it wouldn't be all that expensive as well as being beneficial to the community probably, um, but would produce data that would tell us uh, useful stuff. Um, so that's, that, that and the other thing could be that you could attach that to the responsibility of operating a dam is it to, to study what your dam does, but that's a little bit more of a hard sell, I'd say. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, is actually related. Uh, this is from Anne, and this is for Dr. Bruett. Um, she writes that, unfortunately, dam removal is not an environmental issue that's at the forefront of the minds of most American people. So if you could tell the average person in one sentence why this is so important, what would you say? One sentence and I wrote almost 100,000 words. Um, <laughs> I would say that dam removal restores the flows of species, water, and sediment upstream, downstream, and across the landscape and has more bang for your buck than almost any other one action you could take to restore nature. Well put. Yeah. In, in general, all dams are different, all dam sites are different, and some of you might be thinking, well, that's not true for mine, I mean, if, it may not be true for yours, but in general, I would, I would say that that's true. Great. Um, this is, next question is for the panel, for whoever wants to jump in on this. Uh, this is a question from Susan, and she asks, do dams only come out when removal serves everyone's interest, not when there are powerful interests in favor of the dam? Or can a powerful, inclusive coalition overcome moneyed special, special interests? Mm -hmm. I'd say that if we think about it in terms of wealthy interests that want to keep the dam, that usually means that the dam is 
operating and making a lot of money. And in my observation, dams that produce a lot of economic value are able to pay for you know, state-of-the-art fish passage and um, <clears throat> mitigation by doing environmental work other places. And that's, that seems to be a lot of the time how that goes. Um, a dam that doesn't make any money is probably not going to have uh, wealthy special interests trying to fight very hard for it. Um, what do you all think about that, though? Well, I, I, I would say that uh, there are some dams where sort of the new beneficiaries who might not be making money, say landowners around a reservoir or people who use it can be a pretty powerful and strong political voice in opposition to removal, even if there's not any real economic benefit to the dam itself. Direct in here. And actually, yeah, those kinds of ancillary benefits where people get value from something other than the, the money that the dam produces are a little tougher to negotiate because if it's a case of dollars, then you can try to you know, come up with dollars from elsewhere and figure out how to make the business whole. But um, somebody who likes the dam in place is, is a little tougher to, to negotiate with. Next up, I have a response from Monica, who had asked the question about bio, or about uh, human monitoring after dam removal. Um, she writes that she doesn't have a mic, but thank you, and she tends to agree qualitative rather than quantitative way of measuring it is, is the way to go. She appreciates the input. Um, this is a question from uh, Jim. Um, Jim writes, Dr. Bruitt, thanks for doing this. I greatly enjoyed your book. Is there a dam in the Pacific Northwest that you would most like to see removed in the near future? If so, which dam and why? Goodness. Um, it's not in the Pacific Northwest, exactly. Um, but I have to go classic here and say Hetch Hetchy. Um, I lived in Yosemite for three years. And oh, well, Hetch Hetchy provides a lot of value. I mean, I'm, it, it sustains San Francisco. Um, I, I, would, I would like to see that value gotten from other sources and the big dam in a valley in a national park to, um, to be removed. Hetch Hetch would be my choice. Good answer. Um, the next question is from Chad. And so uh, the background for this question, he writes, PGE dams at Timothy Lake, Stone Creek, and Lake Harriet block gravel from flowing downstream. This has consequences for fish and wildlife, particularly coastal cutthroat trout, which rely on small gravel for spawning. Recently, new gravel and sediment was placed just downstream of those obstacles to help replenish the natural environment. And this is the only gravel augmentation program PGE biologists are aware of that specifically targets cutthroat trout conservation. So with this in mind, um, his question is, are you aware of any other such projects? And do you feel that this is a good option for dams that are not scheduled to be removed for various reasons? Um, I wasn't aware of that project, no. Um, I, this is PGE, this is Portland General Electric, not PGND, the California company, just to make sure that I'm clear about who we're talking about. Yeah, um, I think Portland General Electric. Okay. Um, I mean, it, it seems to me to be, a, uh, just from that quick, quick um, description, it seems like a uh, reasonable approach uh, if you're going to keep the dams in to try to um, keep those flows going. That's one of the things that, that restoration is really about is, is restoring natural flows, whether it's migrations or sediment or, or water. Um, so sure, uh, it's in a lot of cases, I think that something like that would be very expensive and so it would be not, not easy to organize or palatable to people. But if you can find a good way to do it, then sure. Um, that's one of the things that's real subtle about dams that a lot of people don't think of is uh, sediment. And so if, if doing something like that could have an educational um, benefit as well. PG also as part of a Pelton Round Butte settlement on the Deschutes River uh, did some gravel augmentation, had a fund for it to provide some mitigation there. 
Um, but I think I think that money ran out some time ago, um, and I can't tell you that I know the status of those projects. Um, but they they were doing it there as well, on the Deschutes River. Hey, G, I, I, oh, go ahead. I was going to say I believe they've actually done it below uh, Lost Creek uh, Reservoir, or William Jess Dam on the Rogue. Uh, a couple times too. I, I, it has been very successful and it, it's a pretty short duration benefit. To, you know, I, I mean, gravel moves, so you put it in, it's going to move down if you don't have more continuing to come downstream to resupply it. Um, it's not necessarily there very long <laughs> uh, if the dam's still in place. It takes constant replenishment. Thanks, everybody. Um, the next question is for the panel, and this is from Stan. Um, he uh, says that it seems like the success of potential Snake River dam removals is also tied to improving fish passage at Bonneville and Salillo uh, on the Columbia River. Is that being approached as well? Uh, well, Water Watch doesn't work on the Snake River Dam, so it's hard to give you a good answer. But, um, you know, the Columbia, of which the snake is a tributary, has big problems, and dams are part of that. One of the big problems is water temperatures. And, you know, when the water temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit for 70 straight days at the Dalles Dam, as it has been, it was in 2015, and I think it it's been that warm in other years as well. Salmonids are gonna have a tough go of it. There are many things happening right now. There's the, the Columbia River uh, dam operations are, are going through, they just went through an environmental review by the Trump administration and others. There's ongoing litigation over the status of salmon in the Columbia. There's the Columbia River Treaty, which was the subject of one of our webinars uh, two weeks ago the last week. Um, and, you know, all of these things could have some impact on the status of fish in the Columbia. Um, as to whether there's, there's going to be improved fish passage at, at, uh, at the lower Columbia dams before they get to the snake, um, you know, I'm not aware of big efforts in that regard or big investments to improve those ladders. Um, but it's going to take a lot on the Columbia to, to, to still have salmon there in 50 years uh, with water temperatures the way they are. Thanks, John. Um, that's all I've got lined up for questions. I did have two notes from Christine and from Susan, so I put those in the chat. Uh, for folks to take a look at. Um, thanks to everyone for sticking around. Uh, I've got one more message for you and I'm gonna share my screen here for a moment. Let's see. This looks that's a, that's, okay. a diff, that's a different Peter. Oh, you're right. Apologies about that. Um, I'm gonna take a pause on sharing the screen and pull up the right one here. Sorry about that. Thanks for catching. <laughs> No worries. I, know, I, saw, I saw something in the chat while you're doing that. I want to quickly note that sometimes there are contaminants in, in silt, and that is something that people who are interested in dam removal should take care of, especially in kind of a post-industrial landscape. Um, in the east, you're more likely to find that. In the west, you certainly can. Um, but um, that, that, that has happened some places, but was not the case in the road. So just to be clear. Thank you, Dr. Brewitt. Um, give me just a second here and I'll pull up the, the right slide. And um, so here's some information about if you enjoyed this talk and would like to learn more and, and read uh, Dr. Brewitt's book, um, you can buy his book, Same River Twice, The Politics of Dam Removal and River Restoration uh, on the OSU website below. This is the best place to get it. And I will put this link in the chat in just a minute here. Um, also, if you're attending this webinar, we'd encourage you to please consider supporting WaterWatch's work to continue to protect and restore our beautiful rivers here in Oregon by either joining as a member or making a donation or becoming a monthly sustaining member um, to support the dam removal work we've done and will continue to do going forward. 
Um, and you can do that at waterwatch.org slash donate. Um, I'll put that link in the chat too. And um, yeah, we are really happy to be able to host these webinars and to have all of you here. And I think if we don't have any other questions, I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, Dr. Brewitt, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I know I really enjoyed it, and I see a lot of folks on the call here who are, who are chiming in and saying they enjoyed it as well. Um, so thank you very much. We really appreciated it. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And thank you as well, Bob and John, um, and to everyone who's listening. Have a good night. Uh, oh, one last reminder. We're doing this again next week. Um, we're going to be uh, featuring master fly fisher David Hughes. Uh, he's going to be giving a presentation uh, on Wednesday, August 19th at 6 p.m. Um, his presentation will be on 10 practical tips on how to pursue, think, like, and catch more trout. Um, so he'll be including great stories, highlighting incidents where applying these 10 tips made the difference on the water. So this will be a, a big one for anglers and fishermen all across uh, the state, and we'll be making sure to follow up with some more details. Um, if you're interested in signing up for this, you can go to waterwatch.org slash events and get the link to, to register for next week. Um, hope to see you all there. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.